Mr. Vincent Harris, co-founder, REI Real App, investor, and probably best described entrepreneur, man. Good morning up in Montclair, New Jersey. Yeah, morning, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show. Good to see you, bud. My pleasure. You too, man. I told you I've been wanting to, or I've had you on my radar for a while, just knowing you from SAS Academy and hearing you talk at We Live 19, Max's event back in 2019. Gave an awesome presentation on REI Rail and just how kind of life is with social media. You just see people's posts and kind of get an idea of what they are, as a, what they're like as a person. And definitely seemed like a very smart and chill dude, which uh, I try to surround myself with as much as possible. So in Thank saying you. that, we'd love to hear everything that you got going on with REI Rail and your different entrepreneurial ventures and stuff like that. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, um, <laughs> I will first say I am not very good on social media, uh, <laughs> Same. despite, yeah, you know, despite being aligned with a guy who I think is uh, fairly described as a master of it uh, in Max Maxwell. He's trying to get me to do better about it. And so I'm posting more these days, but um, it's just not natural for me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this whole idea of taking pictures of myself and posting them is just a little bit uh, foreign to me. Um, I like Clubhouse a little bit better because it's just, you know, I talk about things that I know and uh, if it resonates, it does. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So anyway, all of that said, um, I'm glad that somebody is seeing the post and that they resonate. Um, some of what we're going on now has made its way to social media. Some of it has not. Uh, you know, my day to day is helping to manage REI Rail, which uh, you and probably a lot of your folks are familiar with. It's mm -hmm. a, uh, a marketing software. It's really lead generation and campaign management. Uh, we have lots of different ways for people to, to reach out to prospects. Uh, but then we do something pretty special on the inbound when people start to respond to that marketing. Uh, we make sure that people never fumble that first call because what we found, uh, Carlos, is that, you know, in our business, and we talked a little bit about this before we started the interview, um, a lot of the folks that we serve are newer in the business. And so we know that there's just a lot of fear around picking up the phone, a lot of fear mm -hmm. around prospecting. And we just discovered early on that if, uh, you know, if they botch that first call, sometimes it's so crushing that they never pick the phone mm -hmm. up again, or they get, you know, what we call FOP, fear of the phone. And so we do something pretty special in the inbound so that when people call in, we can tell them lots of nifty details about that person to help them to build rapport more quickly. So, you know, we're always refining uh, that app. Uh, we are uh, shipping a couple of new features. We just shipped uh, landing pages, which we're really excited about, especially in the context of what's going on in the web with marketing and the privacy stuff that's happening. I can talk about why that's relevant. And we also are shipping our mobile app uh, probably next week, which we're awesome. also really excited. Yeah, so you'll be able to do all this stuff from the field. So just kind of managing the enterprise, right? Um, making sure that folks have what they need on the team and uh, supporting them is, is mostly my day to day. And, you know, when I find a great deal, I, I invest myself. My wife and I are looking at an eight unit right now. Um, we picked up a rental a few months ago. And so uh, we're very opportunistic with our own investing. But uh, like I said, my day to day is mostly running, helping to manage the business. Oh, yeah, right. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I get that. I get that feature request all the time as far as being able to see someone's information pop up on an inbound call where with us, if a new lead calls in, let's say like call rail, for example, it pretty much just has their phone number, the campaign they came from, and it tries to pull the city and state like Montclair, New Jersey, Baltimore, Maryland, wherever. REI Rail is the only app, guys, where I've seen a live demonstration of it, and some of them, a lot of our members have it as well, where it'll literally, it'll literally give you all this information on the, the prospect or the seller when they, when they call in. And speaking to your point of like newer investors or people that have fear of the phone, that just helps eliminate one of those obstacles if the seller calls you and they're like, you don't know who they are, essentially. That helps eliminate that, which is absolutely huge and awesome to see in a piece of software. Yeah, it's, um, it, it was novel, you know, and thankfully we have a patent on it. So we're the only folks who have it and, you know, we should be the only folks you ever see with it, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of it, um, but it's not about patting ourselves on the back. We really, we just really saw an issue. It's the same mm -hmm. one that you just described. And people just, if you didn't come up in phone sales, cause I did, like I cut my teeth on the phone. I started out in financial services, working at you know, big investment firms. And um, a lot of it's sales, man. It's just pounding mm -hmm. the phone, especially back then. 
And so I have done my 10,000 hours on the phone and I know that you got to win those first 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. You just do, you got to win those first 10 seconds or it's, it's really hard coming back. And so, you know, the, the tech really is designed to get out of the way. Good technology eventually um, disappears, right? You don't even realize the tech is doing what the tech is doing. And that's the goal behind our system is to just get the tech out of the way so that you can instantly see that, you know, it's John Doe calling about 123 Main Street, where he went to school, what he does for a living, comps on his house, and you can just begin to have a flow. Mm -hmm. And you and John Doe can have a, a good dance on that phone and you can build rapport. We want the technology to completely disappear into the background. So, you know, we're proud of it, but but um, the system does a whole lot more than that. And, um, you know, I don't want to make this all about the product. Uh, just wanted to, you know, address what you said, but, um, yeah, the system I think is is really good, especially for folks who have that FOP that fear the phone. Mm -hmm. Love it, and I appreciate you even trying to have that awareness about not making about that. But a lot of people use it and helps people out, and I know that you and Max are awesome dudes. Have spent a good bit of time with Max, so I know that you have good intentions for everybody. So more than happy to talk about that. And before we were going live, I was thinking that you would have good insight just talking about where we're at right now into April twenty twenty one kind of just a macro insight on lead generation in this space for wholesalers or just investors that are doing direct to seller marketing. And I'd love to hear maybe like a broad stroke or take at least conversation down the path of what's going to allow people to be most successful generating leads moving forward with all the different outreaches that everybody, you know, everybody's doing similar things. Yeah. So this is something, I mean, we literally could spend the whole conversation on this. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting time. Uh, right before we got on, I was having a conversation with our other co-founder, Justin, who um, I think is even more uh, reticent about interviews and social media than I am. So he's kind of a recluse. But but at some point, you and the other folks on the circuit should begin to get him you know, out here and speaking and, and being more uh, visible because he's the technical brain behind everything that we have built. He built the entire architecture um, and he's literally a genius. But but the conversation that he and I were having was around this very thing. Um, it's an interesting time. It's a really interesting time. And, and, and again, I don't think we have time to tease out everything that's happening, but you got a few major things that are happening in the marketplace, uh, regulatorily, uh, just commercially overall. You've got uh, third-party cookies going away. I can talk about why that's relevant here in a second. You've got uh, a new FCC chair who has a real, I wanna be careful here, um, is very passionate, let's say it that way, about protecting consumers from robocalls and uh, has just taken a very aggressive stance, okay? On a lot of the things that your customers and my customers are accustomed to doing. In fact, one of the first things that she did was to set up a task force specifically to go after robocalls. And so that's got some downstream impacts for people who do what our customers do. So we can talk about that here in a moment. And then you've got a uh, Supreme Court that has been pretty opinionated about, uh, I think what they call the scourge of robocalls. You know, you've got justices who are writing in language, frankly, that we've never seen before on an issue like this. And so it's an interesting time to be a marketer. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting time to be a marketer. The, the watchword for us, the thing that we are advising people is to um, one, make sure you play by the rules. This is not the time to be kind of fast and loose with the rules, okay? Uh, we can talk about some of those rules too, if you want to. But it's also a time for people to learn how to own their audience. Mm -hmm. Never been more important. You can't rely on the platforms. Um, a lot of the sort of easy, you know, just press play and give me the audience that I want. A lot of that stuff's going away. And so we really are big on people owning their audience and teaching them how to do that. And our tools help with a lot of that. So anyway, that was a, a long winded answer. I'm going to try to shorten these up, Carlos. Dude, you're perfect. Be complete dude, there. Dude, that's a very well said. And, uh, I would say concise. And what I was kind of thinking of in my head is you're talking about owning your audience, how you guys teach that. Some people may see that, a lot of people may see that as a negative as far as you can't just pull data, reach out to people. I almost see it as a positive because if you lean into the qualitative of owning your audience and taking that kind of 
methodical or militant approach to doing so. I see that as a, a major benefit. Do we want to talk, do you, do you want to kind of go through that um, chronologically as far as like the third party cooking, the, um, yeah. the FCC and kind of like the, I, I'm not even fully aware of more so the government stuff. I, yeah. I, and I say this all the time, I intentionally don't watch news or anything just because I keep my <laughs> mind as clean as possible. <laughs> Sure, um, sure. But I'm not, I, I know briefly about the third party cooking, um, not as much as the regulations coming downstream. Yeah. So if you want to hit on that and then we can talk about owning your audience, I think that would be perfect for people to hear. Yeah. And we can kind of, you know, skim the cross, the rock across the surface on the first yeah. two and maybe focus on the latter for a bit. For sure. Um, so regulatory stuff. Uh, well, let me start with the third party cooking. I'll just go really quickly through that. Mm -hmm. So Google came out a couple of years ago and said that they were going to get rid of third party cookies. What's a third party cookie? Um, your website, you have a cookie that allows you to know things about Carlos so that when he comes back, he doesn't have to enter his name every time. It's that other, right. Third party cookie is another site that you visit is going to get some of that same information and make it so that Carlos can have a good experience on that website as well, right? So mm -hmm. if you said you had a language preference here, you know, this website's gonna recognize it, but then the third party can cookie you and, and they can make it so that you can also have that same ease of experience, right? But there's, you know, the, 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 the folks who in real life have really used third party cookies the most are not so much the UX designers uh, who are doing things like I just described, it's really been the marketers and advertisers, mm -hmm. right? Who have, 100%. You know, right. It, frankly, in, in some respects, have abused third party mm -hmm. cookies. And that's why you get stalked around the Internet every time you go to you know, a website, look at a pair of shoes and uh, all that kind of stuff. So third party cookies are, are, are likely going to go away, at least the way that we have known them. Far too long a conversation for us to have in depth here. But if people want to contact me directly, we can have at it. Uh, <laughs> but, but moving on from that one, uh, the FCC stuff, this is the one that's. Um, I think should give people some pause and they really should take the time to get to know this. Let me say this first off, we take the regulations very, very seriously. And from our early point, we actually brought on third party compliance. So we have a, a shop that we uh, we have that comes, uh, 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 that we pay for uh, third party outside of our company that helps us to make sure that we are compliant, that our tools are compliant, um, that we're doing things that are not only compliant, but that kind of fit the optics test, right? That if people look at it, they would say, okay, those guys are trying to play by the rules. They're trying to mm -hmm. make sure that their people play by the rules. The most important of the regulations to come down of late is um, probably around, you know, so, so TCPA. TCPA, um, again, longer story than we have to go into here, but there's TCPA and then there's a do not call list. They are not the same. People often conflate them like they're the same thing. They're not. TCPA predates uh, the do not call list by quite a bit. And it governs when you can call people, right? You can't call them before 8 a.m. You can't call them after 9 p.m. It governs, you know, lots of different stuff around outreach to consumers. Do not call is very strictly about saying, hey, if somebody has raised their hand and said, I don't want to be contacted, you got to respect that, right? And there have been a bunch of some sort of gray areas about like, you know, for example, ringless voicemail, mm -hmm. right? really popular in our space, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure a lot of guys in your business are using ringless voicemail or have, I have, I've been using ringless voicemail for five years, five, six years. This is not a new technology. There had been a little bit of a carve out because uh, the courts weren't sure, like, is it a call? Is it not a call? And so people were able to kind of float under the radar a little bit, but the case law in 2020 is pretty definitive. It's a call. It's a call. And so what that means is not only is it subject to do not call restrictions, but it's also subject to uh, consent. So you really are supposed to have consent, express written consent before you leave a ringless voicemail from some, for somebody. Um, you know, I, again, it, it gets really nuanced. Now, I want to be careful. I want to give you full information, but I don't want to bore people. But that's a big thing. And I would just say, if I could leave people with something on the regulatory front, is to make sure they understand TCPA and all the ramifications of it. If you're using ringless voicemail, be very, very careful. And the last thing I'll say about regulatory before we go into owning your audience, which I think is more fun conversation. The last thing I'll say is um, Supreme Court on April 1st of this year rendered a decision nine to zero that actually helped marketers. And a lot of folks who are watching this stuff closely 
who take this stuff seriously were watching with bated breath what's going to happen. Here's what the case was. Guy named Duguid, I forget his first name, sued Facebook. And he said, they sent me a bunch of text messages that I didn't, you know, opt into, yada, yada, yada. And they used an automated telephone dialing system. I won't get into the definition of that. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a, another nuance. But here is what is important. Facebook was sending those text messages because they said they thought that there was a security breach and somebody was using his credentials incorrectly. And, um, and the guy was just saying, hey, I didn't consent to that. I don't even have a Facebook account. What matters for your audience is that the Supreme Court came back and said, actually, that wasn't an automated telephone dialing system. They, they narrowed the definition of an ATDS to be only something that can do automatic number generation. And that matters because it cleared automated texting platforms from having to get prior consent. Mm. This is a huge, huge development, huge development. Everybody, if I could bundle it into one neat little morsel for people, everything that I've been rambling about for the last five minutes, there are technologies that you got to get prior consent, RVM being one. Be careful. If you don't have consent, you can't send RBM. Full stop. End of story. Okay. Um, there are very few carve outs, but for 90% of you, that's the case. For text messaging, what the Supreme Court said 26 days ago is that you do have to abide by do not call, but you don't have to have prior consent. Huge. And so to the conversation that you and I started out with at the very beginning of this, that is why you're seeing people lean into SMS. It ain't new. People have been doing SMS for a while, but they're going to lean into it even more because the Supreme Court has just given that cover. I want to shut up. I feel like I've been talking too much. Dude, you can, no, you can go into this, dude, you're giving perfect answers. I'm telling you, I get, I get, we get asked this stuff all the time. So that's an amazing give right there. And you're saying it very, very well. So that's awesome stuff. Um, and I didn't even know about it. I should be more in the note. And that's just the development this month as far as the, the texting, being able to text. So that's, that's absolutely huge. And people love getting a, hearing a pulse on that. I mean, that's why people go to real estate masterminds at least every quarter and you talk in a room and you talk about your marketing, what was successful, what wasn't successful. Now they're going to be talking new regulations. So that's awesome. If that's high level peak, peak inside of a room of what would be in a, you know, a high level real estate mastermind event that people yeah. pay 10, 20, $30,000 a year for. So definitely good stuff. Hey. And to your point about that, just very briefly, um, this is one of the things that we really pride ourselves on. Like we say all the time, um, even in our marketing, it ain't just software or it's more than just software. This is the kind of stuff that people get when they join our community. Mm -hmm. You know, Justin and I go live every Friday at one o'clock for something called office hours where we talk about this kind of stuff and we answer questions and we take feature requests, but we give them the nuance that maybe they don't quite get from a headline or that somebody didn't quite break down in a podcast because this stuff is important, man. Like you got to stay on top of it or you can get in a lot of trouble really fast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely huge. Yeah. I know even a buddy I met that from a non-real estate mastermind, that was almost just cost of, of doing business. He was like pretty much a hundred percent in 2018 and he got interviewed on some big podcasts, but in 2018, I believe he was close to a hundred percent texting and he would get fines of ten thousand dollars multiple times, and he just saw that as a you know a cost of doing business, and it was well worth it to him. You want to hear a funny story? It's not really funny, actually. It's kind of tragic. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like from the "Are you effing kidding me?" file of, of business stories. So that guy saw it as a cost of doing business, and we've all heard of, of industries like that where they're like, "Okay, I'm going to get some fines. It just is what it is, right?" Mm -hmm. As we've been doing all this research about. Um, you know, staying abreast of everything. Our compliance officer told us a story of a guy that got shut down. They got a huge fine, like tens of millions of dollars because they were calling, check this out, only people on the do not call list. We were like, come again, excuse me? And when they asked, when they asked the guy why he did it, he was like, because nobody calls them. <laughs> he was like, he was like it's the most opportunity because they're on a do not call. So they don't get, you know, a lot of calls. So we figured we could close out of sales. I was like, what kind of bizarro backward world do you live in where you go after business that way? But, you know, anyway, I just thought it was 
I'm hilarious sorry. and absurd at the same time that that is literally what their business model was to go after strictly do not call people do not do that your audience yeah please hey that is in 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 general i love uh i love challenging norms or societal norms or conditioning <laughs> and, and challenging thoughts every day from like a you know as a right. stoic perspective um and like the blue ocean approach of you know i'm the yeah. only person that's doing business in here but uh that's an interesting take on on doing it that way yeah. for sure and we do not, yeah, not uh, that one. <laughs> we don't recommend that. No. Um, that is funny though. Well, dude, let's talk about owning your audience. I feel like that could probably be like sure. the uh, the meat and potatoes of this, as far as we're talking about what what's best for people to do right now into April twenty twenty one. And this yeah. seems like the best, the most qualitative, you know, thing to do. Definitely a big win for texters out there. I know a lot of people that are doing texting, so that sounds like it's a huge win in April. But let's talk yeah. owning your audience. Yeah, owning your audience is huge, man, because, um, you know, and, and uh, HubSpot has put out some nice research on this, a couple of good uh, blogs about it, things like that. Um, they do a good job of keeping people pretty well abreast of what's going on. Um, I'd suggest that folks check out their blog. People should check out Ad Age. Uh, we have a subscription there. But the, the, the idea is this, um, you know, we've all, as marketers, I think, a little bit spoiled you know maybe that's too strong of a word but you know you go into the facebook back panel and you know i want to create a look-alike audience and mm -hmm. you know they're, they're like indoor cats as marketers people have become indoor cats your food's right yes. there your water bowl you don't have to go out and kill anything <laughs> i love that bro i'm stealing that they become <laughs> indoor ahead, cats yeah. yeah so um totally declawed indoor cats right <laughs> is totally what a lot of us have become because mm -hmm. the platforms have made it so easy. I'm just gonna dial mm -hmm. up my profile. I'm gonna create a lookalike audience. I'm gonna upload some emails. And a lot of that stuff is just gonna go away, man. So the big, so people I think are mostly aware of the beef between Facebook and Apple. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if they're not, I can give like 30 seconds on it. So they started beefing, I guess a couple of years ago now. And uh, because Apple, you know, trying to play like they were the white hat in this whole thing and they were going to really respect and stand up for consumers' privacy and things like that. Said, look, when we do our, our iOS update, we're going to make it where people can opt out of all of this, uh, this targeting, mm. this retargeting stuff. And Facebook was like, well, advertisers there, Apple's about to kill your business because you're not going to be able to get to the people that you want to and it's going to destroy experience, this, that, and the other. Both of them were being... Um, maybe a little bit dramatic, maybe even a little bit disingenuous, right? But the point is the same, regardless of whose side you take in this. The point is the same, is that it is going to be harder for you. So if you were doing stuff and you were getting a lot of love because you retarget folks and it shows up on their cell phone, this, that, and the other, it's going to be much, much harder. Because as of iOS 14, and they just pushed it, as of iOS 14, people can opt out of all of that, Right. So you can't rely on that tether, right? To follow them around mm -hmm. on their cell phone. And since most traffic is mobile first, that, that's a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And then you got the third party cookies going away, like I talked about with Google. And so what does that mean? It means that as the platforms have gone from, as the platforms have gone from, there's, the, there's this curve that people, technologists talk about where big platforms like social media systems and what have you, uh, uh, GAFA, they call it, uh, the big four, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Amazon, uh, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, that's them. As they were trying to build audience, they were in what they call an attract phase, right? But as they scale and they go up that S-curve, S they get to what they call an extract phase, right? And so they were doing all this stuff, giving you all these free tools, but they get to a point where they really are extracting from the audience, right? We've all heard the, the, the notion that if the product is free, you're the product, right? Mm -hmm. We're all kind of familiar with that one. And we're very much in that extract phase of the curve. And that's what Apple claims to be trying to fight back against is that we don't want to be predatory to the audience, right? And so, but again, at the end of the day, what it means is you just aren't going to have as many tools. You're just not going to be effective as a lazy marketer so you need to own your audience and what does that mean that means more content right it means more specific 
content. Here's one of the things that we push really, really uh, huge. So another study came out uh, recently, just a couple months ago, and it said that companies that have 10 to 15 landing pages had 55% higher conversions mm -hmm. than companies that had fewer than 10 landing pages. Well, what does that mean? What is a landing page? Landing pages, I am, uh, you know, Carlos, uh, proprietor of Charm City House Builders or House Flippers, and I've got a website, right? That is the way that people used to think about having a web presence. I've got a mm -hmm. website. That's really very 2015, 2016 thinking. What this study is suggesting is that Carlos should have a landing page for his short sale specialty, a landing page for his pre foreclosure business, a landing page for probates, a landing page for, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because each of those is an on ramp into the ecosystem of Carlos, right? And what this study was saying, and they were talking not just in our industry, but writ large across industries, they were saying, that companies that have 10 to 15 of those on-ramps, right? Lots of ways for people to get to them had 55% higher conversions because you are, you have a tighter grip. You have more ownership of that audience, right? They were looking for something really specific and you could speak right to it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's content, it's specificity of content, um, being consistent with it, right? having systems and playbooks where you do have 10 or 12 or 15 landing pages that talk about the individual things that your business does, the solutions that you provide, and beginning to just really love on that audience with lots and lots and lots of value. That's how you begin to own your audience. Because the thing that I think all of us are, are fearful of, especially since we are firmly in that extract part of the curve, is getting to a place, having a business that is so dependent on the platforms that they make an algorithm change, algorithm change, mm. and your business goes away. And there are a lot of people who have been declawed, defanged, and are sitting there, <laughs> right? These lazy ass house cats. And if <laughs> Facebook changes the algorithm, Google changes the algorithm, their whole business goes away. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are trying to train people away from, trying to coach them into owning their audience so that they don't have that happen to them. I love that, man. And that's what I've, that's what's come up in conversation as well. Kind of taking this from back to front of your, of your response here. Um, a lot of shops and maybe some high, higher level level investors are close to hundred percent PPC, whether they're doing nationwide or just in the area. So what happens if Google changes the algorithm and they get their, their, you know, their calls defanged, or if you're, you know, 100% yeah. texting and say that this ruling in, at the beginning of April went the other way, where you have, you can only text people that have opted in, which I know some tools have made it, at some point made it mandatory in the last few months to put an opt-in link or an opt-in message in their first message. So it's like that whole synopsis of what you just gave, where people are reliant on tools is not the way to be, where it's more so reliant on owning your audience was very, yeah. very well said. And I agree with that strongly. Yeah, you got to. I mean, and, and some of those things you just talked about are great. You're right. You still got to put in opt out language in a text message. There's other nuance. Um, and by the way, we, we are actually giving our users um, access to our compliance team. We're doing a webinar with them for free. Um, we can talk offline if you want to make that available to your people. We're happy to Absolutely. Yeah, share our compliance team. They can come on and ask whatever questions they want. Absolutely. That I want to know about the Friday 1 p.m.s with you and Justin, how to join the REI Rail community everything like that. And I can get that, um, offline in it, in a yeah. way as well to get the details. Um, yeah. so yeah, man, it sounds like just one aspect of it, 55 better, 55 better conversion rate. If you have at least 10 landing pages, I mean, that sounds like action item number one. And like Vincent was saying, whether it's different type of seller scenarios you're coming across different parts of town that your business could be in. I'm sure there's a bunch of different type of landing pages that you could add in there. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, awesome stuff. Do you want to add anything else to the the owning your audience in addition to, you know, the landing pages and kind of just that? I think it's mostly the mindset or the mental framework that you're coming from of not being tool dependent and more yeah. so having like a, just like a presence, just a presence in the, the marketing universe, really. That's right. Yeah. Don't be tool dependent. Begin to think differently. It really is a mindset shift. That's probably the best way to think about it. <laughs> is um, you got to come at this thing, uh, step up your content, 
right? The creative has got to get better. People's copywriting skills have got to get better. Um, another thing that we have done is we have brought on world-class copywriters, again, and just given them access for free, like the people that we pay for. Uh, you know, one of our buddies, Donnie Bryant, I think he's done, I think he did uh, $30 million last year. He's done a couple hundred million over the course of his career in sales. And copywriting is going to become so important. Mm. So important. Knowing what words work. And that's everything from what goes on those 10 landing pages all the way down to what do you, what do you say in an SMS message that gets somebody to respond? That's still copywriting. Mm-hmm. Right? So, um, you know, I, I would say those things uh, finally. And then I guess the last thing I would add is I don't want to make it seem like the, the current situation is so doom and gloom. Listen, Google made, you know, I think $100 billion, some crazy number, I forget the number, but they made a bunch of money off of advertising, okay? Mm-hmm. They're not going to make it so you can't advertise. <laughs> um, you know, they're just going to do some things that change, you know, the game a little bit. And so I think PPC is still valuable. I think uh, you got to do some paid, right? You just have to. SEO organic is just a long game and it's really, really hard, but you got to invest in it. You got to invest it. So anyway, I don't want people to think that, you know, the the, the stuff they've been doing is completely uh, moot. It's not. It's just that you got to complicate the picture a bit. You know, you're going to have to do a little bit more heavy lifting is all. Love it. Love it, man. Do you, do you have a hard stop here in, in one minute? I have an internal meeting coming up, but I, I can show up a few minutes late because I still have a couple things to get through. I'm good, actually. I, I cleared a bit of time, so I'm good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Appreciate that, man. Um, well, awesome stuff, dude. I mean, the REI Real mobile app is coming out. I'm going to get all the stuff from Vincent um, as far as joining the community, get you in those calls Friday afternoon so you can hear stuff about this. I know that there is a big percentage of people that love hearing all the nuances on marketing and texting because their business is so reliant on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit, if you'll tell me about the generational wealth tour, because I saw you and Max post about that. I absolutely love that. Um, I am even pretty open about you know, I grew up in, you know, suburban Baltimore, dad, a doctor, things of that nature, went to college, played, played soccer in college a couple of years. I went to a big college and my financial literacy, as far as like investing and knowledge is, has never been good until the last couple of years. So I'm just starting to get into passive investments within the last year and things like that. So I absolutely love anything that's along the lines of this. Kevin Hart has done some stuff. Um, mm-hmm. speaking about That's financial right. literacy, Alex Rodriguez is, is big on that giving back. He started investing in multifamily his rookie year as a um, professional baseball player for any sports fans out there. So I would love to hear kind of your guys intention and hopefully can link up at DC or even if a uh, Baltimore one pops up here, but we'd love to hear about how you're giving back and doing that. Cause it's absolutely amazing stuff. Yeah, for sure, man. So this is something that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, I am, where did this come from? Uh, the very short version is that I'm part of a uh, minority developers group. I'm doing my first development project right now. <clears throat> I haven't really talked a lot about it, but it's a, a fairly large commercial development in Atlanta. And uh, uh, I had done just basic, you know, fix and flip kind of stuff, been a landlord for years, but had never done any uh, anything on this scale. So I joined this group to learn more about development. There's some guys in there, uh, Brandon Rule. Um, who a lot of folks know from social media, killer young developer out of D.C., well, from Milwaukee, but lives in D.C. Uh, he was in there. Uh, some other folks were in there. And so I'm there just to kind of learn. And we were in one of our sessions uh, fairly recently, and we came up with an idea to just like, what can we do to give back? Like, this is cool that we're, you know, iron sharpening iron and all that, but what can we do to give back out to the public? Um, we're all acutely aware that most of our audience is black and brown. Um, we're acutely aware that most of our audience did not come from money. Right. And so, um, Max was kind of like, you know, yo, we should, we should go on tour. And not only should we go on tour and teach this stuff, but we should give it away. So there's a few events out there right now and people have seen them, but ours is free. Um, and it's because it really is, you know, kind of a ministry for us is we were like, what can we say from stage? You know, a bunch of these guys, not me, because I'm not good on social media, but a bunch of these guys have huge social media followers, right? <laughs> they got, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. And we were like, what can we give to this audience? And so that's where the Generation Wealth Tour came from, was what could we do? What could we give back? So we picked eight cities. Um, 
Atlanta was the first, Houston is the second, Charlotte's on there, DC is on there, I think Chicago and Dallas, Phoenix, and somebody else is on there that I'm missing. But we're gonna do these eight cities. We basically show up you know, on our dime and talk about uh, wealth building in general, but with a focus on real estate, obviously, because that's where mm. most of our background is at. But why real estate is so important, why it's such a critical component of a wealth building strategy tax advantages, right? Um, the estate protection uh, that comes with it, all those types of things. So that's where it came from. And that's why we're doing it. And uh, it's just been, it's been really awesome. Uh, quick story about our first stop. We, we did Atlanta first, AKA Wakanda. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was awesome. A young lady stands up in the audience towards the, the back half of the event. She says, I took a bus 18 hours to get here. Yeah. 18 hours to get here to learn this because I have to break generational curses in my family. And I was going to do whatever it took. I get, I get goosebumps right now as I tell that story. Crazy. Um, she says, I got to break generational curses in my family if I want to do the things that I feel like, like I'm called to do. Like you're fine. And so, you know, she's in tears. Um, obviously, you know, she didn't take a bus back. We took care of that, you know, put her on a plane and put some money in the cash app. But but it's it's that's why we're doing this is to be able to reach out and touch people um, that way, but also to give them something that's more than just uh, inspirational, something that's also tactical, practical. People leave there with real instructions on things that they can do to improve their financial literacy and also their financial picture. Oh man, that fires me up. That's amazing. And like the, the in-person is so crucial too, because like those people that's just going to get impressed into their subconscious and like, they're going to remember that and it could change like their behavior and actions that they take for the rest of their she's, life. So she's, she's forever changed. Forget yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's and, and amazing, once man. what's the saying, it's like, you know, once your mind has been stretched, it can never go back to the size it once held. Mm -hmm. Um, and her mind, her consciousness, her belief in what's possible has totally been stretched. And so that's why we're doing this thing. So ginwealthtour.com, ginwealthtour.com, for, yeah, for information about it. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to hit you after this just to make sure I have everything for the, uh, the RRL community, Gen Wealth Tour, everything like that, because you got cool. a lot of cool stuff going on, man. But yeah, that's absolutely awesome. Guys, and what's the best place to, to get in touch with you, man? I'll have everything in the show mm -hmm. notes as far as what I just outlined there, but but let's get let's get the social media following up, man. Very very cool dude. <laughs> yeah. Good heart, everything like uh, that. So again, at Max's urging, I have started <laughs> to post on social media. Um, all of my handles are the same. So on Instagram, it's Investor Vents. On Clubhouse, it's Investor Vents. Um, and even set up the website now. So my personal site is InvestorVents.com. Awesome. So uh, hit me up on IG, DM me, or whatever if you if you care to get in touch. Awesome. Sounds good, man. Awesome conversation. Talked on a lot of things. Appreciate the way you choose to live life. Awesome entrepreneur. And, you know, my favorite thing, helping out people and, and really changing people's lives, which I, I strive to do myself and hope to continue to uh, be able to put in a position to do so. So awesome stuff, Vincent. And hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Make sure you follow. Let's get his followers up and uh, <laughs> hope to see you in person speaking on stage. Yeah, absolutely, man. Looking forward to it. Love you guys. Love what you're doing. Like I said, you know, been to you for a long time. Been on Dan's show before. Love the product. 1.0 and 2.0. Um, you guys are just a good shop, you know, and your heart's in the right place as you do what you do. So happy to support however I can. Appreciate that, dude. Thank you guys and catch you guys soon.